Okay. So, wonderful. Um, we said 12.30 and it is 12.31, so I would say that's as close to Jewish standard time as we will ever get. So, uh, let, us, uh, let us start. First of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We have 167, 170 people and, uh, and rapidly growing, so I'm very excited to have everybody here. Um, Again, my name is uh, Robert Walker. I'm here with uh, with Honest Reporting Canada. Thank you very much for our uh, for joining our uh, educational webinar today. Um, we hope to do these monthly. Last month, many of you were on our program with um, former member of Knesset in at Wilf. And in July, I don't want to uh, announce it yet, but we have a very very special guest uh, in July. So you will certainly get an email uh, being sent out for that. Um, and I want to thank our co-sponsor today um, with Honest Reporting Canada, Husbra Fellowships Canada. Of course, a leading uh, pro Israel campus advocacy organization. Many of you know I was the past executive director, and I want to give them a shout out and a thank you to them for joining. Wonderful organization and the wonderful executive director, Daniel Corrin. So thank you so much to them. Um, of course, today, the, the reason that uh, we've partnered with them and the reason for this discussion, uh, talking about unmasked, you know, the anti-Israel propaganda taking place in academia um, is a tremendously important topic. Um, I really don't want to take too much time away from our esteemed uh, you know, triumvirate of, uh, of panelists, uh, but I don't think that if you're here that you need to be convinced why the issue on campus uh, facing Jewish students and pro-Israel students in general, both um, in academia and in wider campus uh, milieu uh, needs uh, to be addressed. And like I said, that's why we're here. So before we uh, move forward, I first just want to introduce our three speakers. Uh, as a housekeeping note, all three of you have been um, selected as co-hosts, so you should be able to unmute yourself. So uh, I'm going to introduce you and then we will uh, we'll move forward and I will direct questions to you uh, individually one-on-one. -on -one. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, okay, so firstly, Professor Andrew Presson is Professor of Philosophy at Connecticut College and Campus Bureau Editor for the Alga Miner, and the genius on the former Late Show with David Letterman. If you don't believe me, you can Google it on YouTube and uh, look it up for yourself. Um, he's the author of academic articles and books, as well as the works of philosophy for a general audience. And one of his books on common sense, The Strangest Ideas from Strangest, Smartest Philosophers, was named an outstanding academic title by choice. Recently, he has also published two novels, The Second Daughter, written under the pen name Jay Jeffrey, read the novel to find out why there's a pen name, uh, was a semi-finalist in literary fiction at the Kindle Book Review Awards, and he's greatly enjoyed meeting either in person or over Skype with the many book clubs that adopted it. He's also published a recent novel, uh, The Irrationalist. Uh, it's a historical murder mystery based on the tragic life and mysterious death of the famous philosopher and mathematician Rene Descartes. Uh, Professor Gil Troy is a distinguished scholar in North American history at McGill University, currently living in Jerusalem. Professor Troy is an award-winning presidential historian and a leading Zionist actor activist in the foreword to Troy's latest book, The Zionist Ideas, Visions for the Jewish Homeland, Then, Now, now and Tomorrow, Natan Sharansky writes, quote, this magnificent work is a perfect follow-up to Arthur Hertzberg's classic, The Zionist Idea. Combining, like Hertzberg, a scholar's eye and an activist ear, Gil Troy demonstrates that we now live in a world of Zionist ideas with many difficult, different rather ways to help Israel flourish as a democratic Jewish state. Professor Troy has published essays in the American, Canadian, and Israeli media, including writing essays for the New York Times, Campaign Stops in 2016 and 2012. He wrote a weekly column for the Daily Beast, Secret Lives, putting current events in historical, historical perspective and writes a current column for the Jerusalem Post. And last but not least, Rudy Rockman is a noted speaker and writer on Jewish rights. He frequently speaks on college and university campuses and to organizations that are pro-Israel, so thank you. Uh, Rudy's argument about the state of Israel's right to exist centers around the idea that Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel. He views Zionism as a movement or de of decolonization. Uh, Rudy has also criticized intersectionality because of how it has been used to demonize Israel. He has been notably stated that Judaism is not a religion, but rather an ethnic group that is indigenous to the land of Israel. He's a boycott of the BDS movement and believes that the movement's agenda is, read, is rooted in anti-Semitism and that it has contributed to the rise in anti-Semitic incidents on campus. He's also known for his work as a Jewish and Israel rights activist on social media. He has thousands of followers and subscribers on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, and he currently serves on the board of the Israel Innovation Fund, which is a philanthropic fund. In 2018, he received the 36 Under 36 Award for being one of the most influential Jews in the world, and currently in this year, he ran in the World Zionist 
Congress elections as part of the vision slate. So thank you very much to our very distinguished panel for joining us. And I really look forward to learning everything that, uh, that you have to say. So first I wanna just, um, because we have a panel, I'm gonna address the questions uh, individually and we'll, we'll go from there. So, you know, today we're gonna be talking not just about issues on campus in general, because we could talk about that, you know, till the cows come home, but we're focusing really on academia in, in specifically. So I wanna start with Professor Pesson. You know, Pesson, uh, Professor Pesson, if you could give us a three minute really intro in terms of Describe for us what is happening in academia, in the classroom, in, you know, academic journals vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, anti-Israel propaganda. All right. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, first of all, I think you said we could have five minutes, not three minutes. Uh, thank you to our hosts, uh, Hasbara Has Fellowships and Connors Reporting uh, Canada and elsewhere do incredible and important work. And it's a pleasure to be on a panel with, uh, with Gil and Rudy. I've been following Gil's work for years and uh, Rudy's exploits for a number of years in my job at the Algeminer. Uh, and the Pinocchio, was that your era? I think it was, Rudy. That was one of the greatest moments in pro-Israel activism on campus ever. Uh, plus the argument for indigeneity, crucial. So uh, thank you for, for your work there. Um, my uh, day job is Professor of Philosophy at Connecticut College. My uh, side job is Campus Bureau Editor for the Algeminer, which is a terrific news outlet. I'm imagining many of you are familiar with it. If not, subscribe, algeminer.com. And uh, in that capacity, it is my pleasure or displeasure to spend a good number of hours each day scouring the internet to watch what's going on on the campus scene with respect to Israel and with respect to Jews. And as a result of that, I'm typically a very depressing person to hang out with. Um, I think there's a lot of bad news, um, but I, I only have a few minutes to give sort of a wrap up of the state of the campus from my perspective. Uh, I, I would be remiss not to mention, there is also good news. It's not all bad, but I don't have time for the good news right now. Um, so I'll focus on the bad news, the state of the campus. And um, what I, um, I have lots of anecdotes. Um, and uh, what I'll do is go through a few categories of how things are in academia and on the campus right now. Um, I would say uh, when you follow the news closely, there's a lot of difficult and bad news every single day from the uh, perspective of the pro-Israel, the Israel advocate. Uh, in the last few years, it's been going on actually a while, but certainly in the last few years, the, um, the efforts to not merely pass BDS resolutions, but to in fact boycott, exclude, ostracize, harass, intimidate uh, students um, who are not even pro-Israel, but who simply don't hate Israel, the bar is actually quite low, uh, has increased dramatically. And we can perhaps classify these sorts of incidents into a number of categories. So for example, um, faculty driven, that seems to be the, the latest trend. This is an ever changing beast. Um, the role that faculty are playing in this anti-Israel activity has been increasing quite a bit in the last few years. So faculty driven either boycotts or ostracization, I'll mention a couple of anecdotes I could give probably a dozen in each category. Um, happening right now, there's a lawsuit pending against the University of Massachusetts. There is a Jewish pro-Israel student, also happens to be a Trump supporter. Uh, two faculty members and a graduate student orchestrated a public campaign to defame him, defame him as a racist and white supremacist, ultimately driving him off campus. Um, last year, in the past year, the NYU Department of Cultural Studies voted to disaffiliate from NYU Tel Aviv. Um, last year, in the past year, DePaul University, um, the ent nearly the entire faculty passed a resolution condemning one of their members for uh, the crime of uh, publishing a pro-Israel op-ed. Uh, so it was a faculty-wide condemnation. And um, the faculty at Pitzer College in the past year or so um, have voted to disaffiliate from the University of Haifa program that uh, as a foreign abroad study abroad program there. Student driven targeting and ostracization. Um, uh, in this past spring, a student at CUNY Law School, School published a piece outlining how she was essentially driven from that campus because of her support for Israel um, via various forms of harassment and targeting. Uh, there's a lawsuit pending at Cutsdown University right now, a student who was um, driven out from there because of the anti-Semitic behaviors of her roommate and her roommate's friends. Uh, in the past few months, a student president at University of Michigan was harassed to the point that he had to publicly apologize for having criticized the Palestinians at one point when he was in high school. And by the way, it was a very tame criticism, uh, if you look at the details there. 
student-driven isolation of Zionist groups from progressive causes. This is very trendy right now. As we all know, campuses are hotbeds of progressivism, liberal progressivism. I personally think there's much of merit in that, in that area, but um, God forbid you be a Zionist student who wants to participate in any of these. So just a couple of examples. Um, George Washington University this past spring, the JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, put out an uh, announcement um, saying that uh, Zionism has no place uh, on left-wing spaces to be immediately followed by a proclamation by a group called Students Against Imperialism, a nice left-wing group, um, announcing that Zionism and racism and has, has racism and has no place in their progressive movement. Uh, a Canadian example, York University this past spring, Multicultural Week, was led with a, a ceremony with a young woman who had a big t-shirt saying anti-Zionist vibes only, making it clear that if you care about multiculturalism, you cannot be a Zionist, you cannot participate. Uh, a year and a half or so, or so ago, a Cal State Polytech, the Black Student Union put out a call um, listing a bunch of demands they have. This is the tenor of the times. Um, and along the way, they demanded um, the increase of student funds for every student group on campus except the Zionists. So they specifically singled out the Zionists as not deserving of funding. Administration-driven support um, supported or supported isolation of Jewish groups from progressive causes. Let me merely say that offices of diversity and inclusion, which are popping up absolutely everywhere all over North America, um, tend very largely to be anti-Zionist and they are explicit about that and will put out proclamations supporting BDS. Student support of terrorism. Uh, it's shocking to have to say that, but in fact, students uh, increasingly, openly, anti-Israel students support violence and terrorism, starting from the endless cries of Intifada that SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, members will utter in various contexts on campus to celebrate open celebration of murderers of Jews, uh, a big episode at Berkeley just this past uh, spring, actually was around December or so. Um, I won't go into the details there, but Jewish students have to walk around in an environment where they openly praise the murderers of Jews. Uh, verbal harassment, explicit threats, vandalism. Let me just mention a couple of cases just from a month or two months ago in April. Uh, Middlebury College signs for the Jewish Center were torn down. Um, the Ohio University Hillel building was spray painted with 11 swastikas. University of Massachusetts, once again, the Hillel there was defaced with the word Palestine in Arabic on Holocaust Remembrance Day. That was just a few episodes just in April. The swastikas everywhere during the school year, I don't know, twice a week, three times a week, another school was reporting instances of swastikas. So you put that all together, you have an environment where Jewish students in particular who don't hate Israel. Again, you don't have to be an active pro-Israel person to be the target of this. You have to merely not hate Israel. Um, but such students are really being targeted, ostracized, excluded, harassed, threats of violence. I didn't even talk about threats of violence and a couple of episodes of actual violence. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, the episode at York University this past fall, which, came, which uh, uh, ended up in physical scuffles and people getting hurt. Uh, it's a very difficult environment, and um, a lot of it is being driven, of course, by SJP, but finally, by the faculty, by academia, which has turned in large measure, whole swaths of academia, the, the humanities, the social sciences, have become so uh, virulently anti-Israel that they establish a tone or a tenor on campus that just allows this to thrive. And uh, ultimately, if we think about ways of responding, we have to deal not just with the students who maybe can be excused for being young and naive and innocent and ill-informed, um, but the faculty who ought to know better and who are driving a lot of this in their research, in departments which sponsor anti-Israel events, and of course, in their endless support of the student activists who are responsible for many of these episodes. So that was a highly abbreviated, quick overview of the state of the campus. And as I mentioned, it's pretty depressing from my perspective. Thank you. Okay, um, I was gonna say wonderful, but not wonderful. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> not wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> not wonderful. Uh, thank you for sharing. But like I said, I think you've given, uh, you know, uh, next I wanna move on, like I said, for a sort of intro to Professor uh, Gil Troy. Uh, me, Professor, you could uh, dig down a little bit uh, deeper in terms of uh, giving your perspective, like I said, giving us an overview, um, you know, on, on specifically in academia as well, if, uh, if that's uh, something you would uh, be so kind to address. Sure. Well, good, uh, good afternoon. Good evening for me uh, from Jerusalem. I'm listening to uh, a real hero, uh, Andrew Pesson, who himself, you were too modest to mention, uh, Professor Pesson, but you endured uh, a horrific firestorm 
uh, and we really personally targeted in the most uh, aggressive and ugly way, I think back in 2015, and I really just honor you for your courage and for being so out outspoken and, and, and standing for truth. And I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, no, it can't be. Like you, I'm a, a product of arrested development. I got to the university and never left. I love the university. I love the university as a place of free thought, as a place of true liberalism, as a place where someone can come up to me and say, you know, I disagree with the point that you've made. I disagree with the stance you've taken. Let's have coffee. And unfortunately, if you want to dig down deep, Robert, that university has disappeared. That university doesn't exist. It exists in our mind. And increasingly, especially in places like York, and we should emphasize also that there are different campuses that are, that are, that are worse. Um, McGill University for many years was very quiet. Uh, we benefited from having Concordia be the hotbed. Uh, in, in the last couple of years, I'm sorry to say that uh, the Palestinian forces have, have, have focused on um, McGill and, and there have been a series of incidents, but it's systematic. And so it, it really hurts me to have this kind of conversation, but it's necessary. And I honor all the uh, important organizations that are helping out. Now, let's dig deeper and also look at this moment right now. Because whereas I like to be an optimist, and you know, both David Ben-Gurion and, and Golda Meir said, you can't be a Zionist and a pessimist, and I'm a Zionist. But right now, we are on the cusp of really a perfect storm. First, in the United States, and even in Canada, the enmity against Donald Trump is so intense that to the extent that Donald Trump likes Israel, people follow the transitive property. If uh, Trump likes Israel, and I hate Trump, therefore I have to aid Israel. And that creates this base that's been building. And now with the horrific murder uh, of uh, George Floyd and the surge um, in very important conversations about racism and Black Lives Matter, what's happening is a package is emerging. And underlying it is a sense of the world is binary. Whereas we academics benefit from complexity. We, be, we academics benefit from seeing the grays, not the blacks and whites, not the all or nothing. The package that we're seeing now is saying either you are anti-Trump, anti-racist, and jump, anti-annexation, and anti-Israel, or I cancel you. And so whereas <laughs> looking back, um, the last year, the last five years, the last 10 years were sobering. I'm worried that things are going to get even worse. And I agree with you uh, that a lot of it has to do with what I call educational malpractice on the part of our colleagues, professors who think their job is to hijack the podium and use their power, not to open minds, but to shove uh, ideas and, 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 and certain political positions down people's throat. So we have to be sensitive to this problem of educational malpractice. We have to be sensitive to uh, Professor Judea Pearl, uh, the father of Daniel Pearl, calls this not just anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism, but Zionophobia. And I like that because it captures the obsessive nature of the hatred and the systemic nature of the hatred. And we have to understand that this is not just a fight for Israel. This is truly a fight for the, the core of the, of the university. This is truly a fight to save the integrity of the university. And we're seeing it again, especially in America, that they tried out the attack on Israel, and now they're turning the attack on Zionism into an attack on Americanism. And this whole 1619 project that tries to reread American history, not through the lens of 1776, but through the arrival of the first slave ship. And of course, racism is horrific. And of course, there's a problem of systemic racism. But we also have to understand that until we are able to embrace complexity, embrace subtlety, embrace nuance, the university itself is going to be in trouble. And so I'm, I, I wish I could disagree with you, Professor Pesson. I wish I could say, no, 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 I'm seeing good signs. But I will, see, I will end with um, two bright spots on the horizon. One, is that to the extent that this is a Hobbesian and Marxian fight, and it's all about politics, and it's all or nothing, we lose. But to the extent that we can have what I call the jujitsu, take the negative and turn it to the positive, 
to the extent that we've been able to through programs like Birthright Israel, through some of the important work that you've done through Hasbara Fellowships and Honest Reporting, to have a conversation that's not just about politics, but also about identity. And we talk over the professors and we talk past the activists. And instead, we have a deeper conversation with our own Jewish students and say, who are you? What do you stand for? And we're inviting you to come to a conversation about Israel that is multidimensional and complex, not for the sake of defending Israel, but for the sake of stretching your soul and learning in a deeper way about who you are. Because ultimately, if you truly want to ally with others, if you truly want to help others, if you truly believe in pluralism, first you have to do what I call Pilates. You have to strengthen yourself, strengthen your own identity. And once we do that, we can understand that, yes, there are insights to be had from intersectionality, saying that, yeah, trauma is trauma and bigotry is bigotry and many different people have absorbed different forms of bigotry and we can learn from one another. But don't block Jews at the intersection. And once we have Jewish pride on campus, and we've seen in the last 10, 15, 20 years, thanks to things like Birthright and Massa, and, and a whole panoply of Jewish organizations pushing back, at least some progress, we can then be true allies in the fight for justice. And we can have it in a nonpartisan and multipartisan way and let those from the left love Israel from the left and those from the right love Israel from the right. But us as Jews and as Zionists love Israel together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Troy. I, you know, before we move on uh, to our, or as we, uh, we introduce our third panelist, Rudy Rockman, maybe I want to ask you a bit of a different question. You know, in the bio that I read, um, and in the, um, you know, and certainly in Professor Troy's comments there, we sort of talked about or highlighted Black Lives Matter, intersectionality. I mean, I think this is George Floyd. This is on, although this is, you know, uh, Honest Reporting Canada. I mean, the reality is this is a still a news that's certainly talked about around the world and I think will impact and has already impacted Israel advocacy. Can you maybe talk a little briefly about what exactly is intersectionality in your experience, Rudy? And, you know, sort of uh, pull out your crystal ball and what you think that's going to look like once uh, campuses in theory start back in September. So it's kind of part of like what I was going to talk about today. So first of all, we have to understand what a campus represents and why it's so important in this conversation. Uh, first of all, the, the people coming out of college campuses represent the future political and intellectual class of a generation. So those coming out of college which campuses eventually become, uh, you know, places in politics and media, uh, there's doctors that will run a country and then a society and the pop culture of that society are those coming out of college campuses which is important to make sure they come to this factory called the university, they're not stamped with all these different ideas that make them anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Now, what is intersectionality? It's basically this concept and idea that if all minorities unite together that are facing some sort of oppression in a society, then they're able to transcend the oppression together or better fight with each other in order to move forward for what they're experiencing. However, the way it's being used is that uh, the minority students are being reached out by the anti-Israel group on campus and they're telling them that they're suffering is either the same suffering that they experience when it comes to Israel and the Palestinians or similar. And that's exactly the anti semitic formula that exists throughout history. Find the source of suffering and pain of a community and blame on us. So the death of Jesus, let's blame that on the Jews. Like the, Jews the economic situation in Germany, let's blame that on the Jews. And today we see you know, genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, homophobia, white supremacy, all these hot topic ideas that the world should be fighting against and it's important to fight against are being attached and associated with Israel. And then they go a step further, they'll go to the Black Students Association and say, well, you have associating us to that same pain and trauma and suffering, but also now blaming us for that and spread and how we've been able to the reason why this mess spread is because, you know, I, I kind of look at the, the situation as an analogy of a sports team. You have Team Israel and you have Team Anti-Israel. Team Anti-Israel is practicing, recruiting the best players, uh, the best coaches, making the best facilities, making sure that their team are going to be the best team that wins the World Cup or the championship or whatever sport that they're playing. And Team Israel is on the sideline bench talking about how 
their jerseys were made with Israeli technology while whispering to each other. And we ask ourselves, why are we not winning the game? Well, the answer is that most of us that are Jews and Zionists tend to speak in our own little shtetls and our Hillels and our Beit Chabad's and our little pro-Israel groups. And we'll do like a Israel Hummus event with some Omer Adam, we'll sing to each other, we'll, we'll be proud amongst ourselves, we'll give each other a pat on the... And we ask ourselves, why is the campus becoming increased? anti-Israel and apathetic to these issues, well, it's because we haven't done anything to change the campus. If you look today on a college campus and you go to a classroom, if there's a professor or student that says something racist, most black students are conditioned and prepared to deal with that situation ideologically and intellectually and can respond to the racism. And most students that are not black are conditioned and prepared to side with those black students against racism. However, when it comes to most Jews are taught to actually stay silent. Don't say anything. If you say something, it'll just get worse. You know, don't make a mess. You'll get a bad grade. You know, get the good grade. Say what you need to say to your professor. Write what you need to write. And eventually, you'll just donate money to some organization and it'll trickle back down. The reality is that the world changes from the bottom up and not from the top down. And that's what we see happening on college campuses. When I transferred to Columbia University, and I chose it because at the time, it was rated the number one most anti-Semitic university in the Algemeyer uh, newspaper. And for me, I wanted to go to the hardest place because I was so tired of all these excuses of my peers or the parents of my friends saying, oh, well, I'm not going to send my, my son or daughter to the school. It's too anti-Zionist. It's too anti-Semitic. It's too hard. And for me, I was like, that's Dafka where we need to go. These are the universities we need to go to to change the campus climate, to change the way things are done. Because the beautiful thing about a campus is apart from the faculty, the student groups, things can change within four years. So when I started at Columbia, the time we set up a table with a flag, students came up, ripped the flags off, ripped our stuff, spat at us, said horrible things. And after two and a half years at Columbia, it started to become normal that there was an Israel group present that we can speak our minds. They may have not all agreed with us, but the shift, the, there was a shift in the climate. There was a shift in the way people approach. There was an understanding that there's another narrative here and it's not just one-sided. So whenever someone comes to a college campus, they have to understand that within a year, two years, three years, you can actually have a radical change on your campus. Our methods of, of what we had created was empower, educate, and expose. The first and most important thing that I think a, a student or someone involved with activism on a college campus has to do is to empower the core group meaning Jews and allies to be able to rise up, speak our language and know how to uh, debate, know how to do public speaking, know how to uh, build coalitions, not, know how to talk about Israel to the right, know how to talk about Israel to the left. All these things that we should actually have been taught in our Jewish education, whether in our synagogues with our parents and Jewish day schools and summer camps, whatever form of Jewish education we, we received growing up, we should have been taught how to be Jews, not only in theory, but also in practice. The second thing is to educate and to narrate the story of Israel. Now, if I'm selling a product in Spain and I'm speaking Spanish to my target audience and I want to sell that same product in America, I have to shift the language to English for my market to understand what I'm trying to sell. So same thing today, we've been taught to talk about Israel in terms of how many accomplishments it's made. We create the cherry tomatoes, the tripurgation, startup nation, we're the only democracy in the Middle East. But none of those answers actually answers the question, who are the Jewish people and why does Israel have a right to exist? Because Thailand is a monarchy, Singapore is a semi-dictatorship, Jordan is also a monarchy and no one's questioning their right to exist. So why are we answering that Israel is a democracy as a sort of token to be able to have legitimacy. I mean, first of all, I don't expect anything less from the Jewish people than to have a democracy. If anything, I expect us to create something even better than a democracy. However, even if we weren't a democracy, that does not give us legitimacy. So we have to be able to speak the language of the generation, which cares more about things that are deeper and more substance and more in, in terms of, of, of justice and, and using emotions in order to convey that message. So something that we've crafted to talk about Israel, instead of saying, oh, well, in 1948 and the Balfour Declaration and UN Partition plan. We say that the, the story of Israel is the story of a 4,000-year-old native population from the land of Judea. They were displaced from their land by a Western white imperial nation called the Romans. During the displacement, they still maintained a constant presence in their land that was through that. We created the most indigenous liberation movement that ever existed. For the first time in history, a native population revived their language, revived their civilization, and kicked off the oppressive force, which happened to be and so when you talk about Israel using that language, all of a sudden people understand, okay, now I get why you have a right to exist and who the Jewish people are. The Jewish people aren't, I mentioned that I often talk about Judaism not being a religion. 
Now, we were always taught as a Jewish community to call Judaism a religion. And for what most Jews mean, I actually agree with them. However, the definition of a religion is a belief system and a God, deity, book, or prophet. So if you don't believe in that God, deity, book, or prophet, you are not part of that religion. Hence, if you reject Jesus, you're not a Christian. If you reject the teachings of Buddha, you're not a Buddhist. And if you just accept Jesus, you're a Christian. You accept Muhammad, you're a Muslim. Those are religions. Judaism is and it isn't for any population. It's way more than a belief system, and it is condition. It threatens and call their civilization and their tradition and nation, not a nation as of the U.S. and Australia. And you would understand their native culture and their history and their language and their value system and their ethics and their aspirations and their connection to a higher power and their connection to the land all fall under a suitcase that they created when they were displaced from the land in order to preserve that identity. So for me, civilization's identity, way of life, connection to a higher power, where we pass that down generation to generation, the Dova Do, with the aspiration of the Shana Babi Shalim, reviving that civilization and going back next year in Jerusalem. Now in terms of exposing, it's our responsibility to go out and expose the book anti-Israel and that use sort of platforms to convey message as if they're good. So for example, SJP and JBP, Students for Justice in Palestine or Jewish Voices for Peace, a lot of people would call them these are a pro-Palestinian uh, group. But for me, they're not pro-Palestinian because they never talk about the Palestinians dying by the thousands in Syria, the hundreds of thousands in refugee camps in Lebanon, the equal rights in, in the border. Out of context, they don't, don't talk about how there were three wars before waged ethnically cleansed the Jewish state and the Jewish people and the consequences of those wars and the failed policies on both sides is the reality that exists today which is the status quo so they'll take a suffering they'll take it completely out of context they'll also cherry pick which sufferings they want to use and use that as political ammunition to attack Israel so what's important to understand is that we should have a space that's an identity in Palestinian rights on campus. However, it is being hijacked by SJP and they're using that space in order to target Israel. So I would actually make the case that they're not only anti-Israel, but they're actually anti-Palestinian. Functional them to keep Palestinians suffering to pursue their true agenda, which is only as we would go to every single event that these groups held and we would expose them. We would ask questions, uh, we would show how they wouldn't be able to answer, we would catch them on film, and then we would spread this, not only to expose them to the rest of the campus that they shouldn't be associated with a group like this that's really a hate group, but also train young Jews and allies to be able to know how do we respond to certain questions, to certain issues. I love Israel, I know Israel's on the right, but I've never been taught or given the courage and the tools in order to be able to articulate myself, and that's actually the failure on our part. You know, we say after the Shoah, never again. When I went in March of the Living, uh, and for the first time I, I saw what happened in Poland and also learn what happened in Germany. It wasn't the first time that I had learned this. I wasn't frustrated by who the Nazis were because to me, it wasn't a surprise. I was raised my entire life uh, understanding who the Nazis were. Half of my family on my father's side was massacred in the Holocaust. So what shocked me the most in that trip is what did the Jews or what didn't they do as anti-Semitism was rising? Because it didn't happen overnight where one day the Jews were a society and the next day were being uh, burned in ovens and gas in, in, in gas chambers, right? It took it 10 years of an evolution where anti-Semitism rose. And what was the response of most Jews to that? Well, it was to do nothing. Don't worry about it. You know, just go away. Let's make friends with power. And that same mentality is the mentality that we're having today is America. Don't worry about it. Don't do anything. If you make something, the vote, but you put your head down. We'll just to be uh, you know, senators and pass some bills. Well, who are the future senators? Who are the future congressmen? Who are the future people going into positions of power and, and influencing pop culture? So it really doesn't matter what bill you pass or what law you pass. Those laws and bills will be overturned the second that the people coming out of campus will get into positions of power. And never make one makes such a big deal on BDS, but even if a BDS passes on a college campus, university doesn't divest. And even if a university like LA or Brown or whatever university passes a, a BDS resolution, how much money is that university invested in Israel in the first place? So the problem is not if BDS passes or not, the problem is that it's even to talk about that. Imagine there was a movement to boycott the civil rights of black people. The problem wouldn't be if a resolution passed. Of course, it would be a problem. The problem is that that's even a relevant part of a conversation and even acceptable to talk in an academic space. So it's an ideological war and passing a BDS or not should be very minor to the fact that this is acceptable to even talk about. And we need to be able to narrate our story to expose uh, anti-Semitism and to empower the next generation because it's our responsibility to write the next chapter of Jewish history. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Rudy. Um, I want to, you know, you touched on a couple things there, um, and I want to pivot to Professor Pesson with my next question here. You know, you described, uh, you know, if I'm understanding correctly, you were basically describing, okay, it's one thing, you know, to be focusing on, uh, you know, going after the decision makers now, but, you know, I think your critique is that we're missing the next generation of decision makers, and how do we impact them? Because they're going to be the ones sort of crafting, uh, crafting rather, policy of tomorrow. So I want to pivot now to, like I said, to uh, Professor Pesson and ask him, him, you know, your uh, 40 worst campuses, uh, you know, uh, ranking, so to speak. Um, I'm curious if you can speak a little to that in terms of how you, if, for those of you who are not familiar, perhaps uh, Professor Preston can speak to that. But again, it's a, it's a ranking of the 40 worst campuses in North America. And I'm curious, A, how you derive those, those figures. Um, you know, is there a scientific study, so to speak, or a scientific uh, method for it? You know, what's, the, what's the, uh, the method that you use to determine worst and best? Um, and really, what do you think is sort of the state of anti-Israel propaganda, so to speak, uh, today? Do you think that the issues are more, you know, insidious behind the scenes, so to speak, in that we should be going after, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Coalitions and intersectionality, the way that we haven't necessarily been doing in, in past decades? Or is it the issues of, say, 10, 15 years ago, which is flag burnings and apartheid walls? And, you know, people remember Concordia. I don't know if Professor Troy was in Montreal to Concordia 2002. So, in other words, in my personal view, it sort of shifted from in your face to behind the scenes. So, I guess the, the two, you know, the two-part question for Professor Pesson, one, is that your view as well? Um, you can disagree with me. Uh, and two, is that, you know, curious to maybe speak to how you measure, so to speak, the worst campuses in North America and how you define good or bad, so to speak. So that's, that's quite a pair of questions. Um, and I'll I have only a few minutes to respond to. Um, well, it's pretty clear that the main strategy we need to pursue is to create more people like Rudy and populate our campuses with them, right? And I don't quite know how to do that other than to support Rudy and his endeavors, because um, everything he said there was absolutely correct and we could all expand upon it. Um, I think um, uh, uh, what the part of the problem is the battle is occurring on many levels simultaneously, and we are generally speaking grossly outnumbered on campuses. Even if we could create all the Jewish students to be Rudy's, um, there's just a lot more of them than there are of us, as it turns out. And uh, with identity politics being all the rage, and this is also a crucial part of intersectionality, um, a, a young man named Elliot Kaufman wrote a wonderful essay a couple of years ago in commentary. Um, showing that arguing that intersectionality is really a political organizing principle more than e in addition to being a, this sort of theoretical construct and it develops it promotes a situation where basically you are told if you belong to a certain category this is what you should believe if you're black this is what you should believe if you're asian american or indigenous or whatever it is whatever the category is you have a certain set of beliefs and the idea that within a category people can disagree amongst themselves is heinous because if you disagree, and this also speaks to Professor Troy's comments, if you disagree, you're canceled. If you disagree with the tactics in the Black Lives Matter, no matter how much you support uh, promoting civil rights for blacks and protection from police or whatever it is, but if you disagree about a tactic, it's not just a disagreement, you're a racist, right? It goes to this incredible extremeness. And so um, with this identity politics on campus, you create these coalitions and the um, and the strategies that Rudy was talking about that the other team pursues is, is devastating. It's powerful. Every single BDS resolution on the campus is driven by SJP and JVP, perhaps, but invariably they have 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 co-sponsors, and it's all the progressive groups because they've managed to develop this theory of intersectionality where all modes of oppression are linked and where um, Anybody in a category has to believe the basic principles that the leaders dictate, otherwise they're against, like you're either with us or, or against us. And so we are grossly outnumbered. We do need to, we meaning Zionist students, pro, uh, Jewish students, need to work on those coalitions, but the odds are stacked so heavily against us just by the numbers. Uh, this, the problem is going on, as I said, on multiple levels. So the professors are developing all the theory. <laughs> And the theory, the frameworks that we're living in these days are anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, uh, identity politics and intersectionality. The professors develop the theories, the activists then manipulate those theories to turn them all anti-Israel. Um, and once you've developed these coalitions, it's invariably, it's the Jews who are on the other side, right? And so the professors are developing the theory, the activists are applying the theory to the campuses, and then of course, creating the coalition. So it's, uh, in terms of campus strategies, we need to fight on the academic level, we need to fight the activists, we need to fight the coalitions. 
and there's just not enough of us, uh, you know. Uh, so I don't mean to be pessimistic. Maybe I am pessimistic. It's clear what we need to do. Rudy spelled out a whole bunch of things, uh, changing the narrative, right? So right now, everyone's in favor of the oppressed, the co colonized, the people who've suffered from imperialism. And it's too easy to tell the story where the Israelis do that, uh, uh, colonize or imperialize or ethnic cleanse the Palestinians. And we all know the true story is the bigger story that Rudy was saying, no, we're the indigenous people. We're the ones who were kicked out by imperialists and colonizers. We need to change that narrative. How to do that is tough when we're deeply outnumbered. So campus strategy, we need to work on many levels. Um, there's now you know, talk going on. Uh, Lyle Leibovitz wrote a very interesting piece last year I'm seeing more discussion of this. Maybe it's time for the Jews to get out of the universities that, that we have here. Um, that's a very pessimistic thing to say. And I tend to side with the way actually Rudy put it a few minutes ago, which is if we withdraw from Columbia University, it's too anti-Semitic there, or there's too much anti-Zionism, then we yield that campus to the other side. So collectively, I don't endorse this policy that we have to stop going to the nasty campuses. I think that's to, to surrender. However, that said, I completely understand any individual, either a student or their parents, who look at what's going on on these campuses and see swastikas appearing everywhere and Hillel's being defaced and attacked and say, I don't want my kid to have to deal with that. So on the personal level, I understand the desire or instinct to retreat or withdraw. Um, uh, but on the collective level, that can't be the right, it seems to me, can't be the right strategy. That said, so how do you know where to go? So um, you mentioned the Algaminer a couple of years ago. We did it, I think, two years in a row. We uh, produced a list of those, the best and worst campuses for Jews. Um, and I think we can't, was it 40 on each, each side? And uh, uh, you know, there's proprietary information there behind the, the strategy. We tried to be as quantitative and scientific as we were capable of. It's, it is very hard to quantify and be scientific about these things. Um, and you know, one interesting, issue that we came up with, um, I want to talk about Columbia University, so Rudy's um, home school there. Uh, you know, depending how you look at it, uh, Columbia is one of the best schools to go as a Jew and also one of the worst schools to go as a Jew simultaneously, right? It's got incredible Jewish resources, it's got incredible um, Jewish community, incredible Zionist uh, community as well. But at the same time, it's got a really ground zero, vicious anti-Zionist, uh, arguably anti-Semitic community as well. So. Um, there's a lot of finessing that goes on when you try to make a list of who, what are the 40 worst, what are the 40 best, and you know, we didn't want to end up publishing something where Columbia was in first place on both of those lists. So I won't go into further details on that, other than to say, um, you know, as you're choosing what schools to go to, it's a, partly it's a personal thing. Do you have the stomach to be a warrior for Israel or not? And many individuals won't. It's very difficult. If you do have the stomach and the nerve, and you know, we have to support and encourage those people because they are our um, warriors. Uh, um, and it, it really is a war. It's a cognitive war. Um, it's a war of ideas. It's a war of academic theories. And then on campus, it's becoming a physical war. As I've said, threats of violence, the support of violence, several episodes of actual violence. It is getting extremely ugly and uncomfortable for Jews on campus. So I think we have to be prepared for that. So it didn't fully answer your question, but I didn't also want to take up all the time. Oh, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate covering that. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, I want to next move on to Professor Gil Troy. You know, something that uh, that both our previous speakers, Rudy and and the Professor Pesson, have, have mentioned is resetting the agenda. You know, uh, one of the things that Rudy mentioned is, uh, you know, our opponents they they present these BDS votes and BDS votes and BDS votes, and even though with increasing frequency or, or with a lot of frequency they lose, I think uh, what he's saying, and I think many of us would, would agree, we certainly don't want to lose those votes, but just the fact that they're presented is a problem. So, you know, Professor Troy, you, you've been, uh, you know, with your finger on the pulse for a long time on campus. In your experience, what do you see is really the, the best way that we can reframe uh, the, the debate away from sort of defending Israel against, you know, particular claims and particular libels? Israel does A, no, it doesn't. Here's the defense. Israel does B, no, it doesn't. Here's the defense. Tell me from, from your perspective and your experience, what's the best way to re, sort of reshift uh, re the, the, the discussion and push it more to the offensive, so to speak? First of all, I, I think we have, to be a, we have to do a much better job of choosing our battles. We usually wait to be reactive. We usually wait until they attack and then we start attacking. And I saw this at McGill University. They start yelling, we start yelling. And you know what most Canadians do? They put their fingers in their ear and say, I've had enough because I'm Canadian. I want to be nice and I don't want to have all this, this tension. And, and the, the, the hostility 
of the Palestinians against the Jews ends up somehow marking the Jews and the Zionists too. So I think we have to think much more strategically. We have to, we have to be more proactive than reactive. Um, one of the things I start to push with my book, The Zionist Ideas, and in my earlier book, Why I'm a Zionist, is what I call identity Zionism. And identity Zionism doesn't just start when you get to campus. It doesn't just start if you go on a birthright trip. It starts, and I think um, you know, Rudy could probably have interesting things to say about this too. It starts in your home. It starts in your day school. It starts in the conversations there where we have to really raise a generation, not of fighters, but of lovers of Israel. If Israel is really in your bones, if, is, if I can't cancel Israel, because to cancel Israel would be to cancel myself, then we win. And we have, uh, uh, we have troops going in sort of armed for battle, not because they're fighting to do the right thing to make grandma happy, but they're fighting for themselves when they're attacked. And we, as a Jewish community in general, have done a terrible job of that. Um, we often try to teach Israel uh, in, in Jewish day schools or in synagogues through Israel advocacy, and we have to do it through identity. We do it through the guilt trip rather than through the Jewish journey. And we also don't do it with enough nuance. And so when they get to campus and they've only been told Israel's perfect in the land of Habanagil and blue and white flowers, they don't have the resilience to have a more nuanced battle and they don't have the, the, the ability and many of them flip and give up. But part of it also is we have to understand that part of it is they want to be accepted because I, I think it was, uh, I, I think it was Andrew or, or, or Rudy said is they've been raised by their parents to fit in. They've been raised by their parents to get the good grades. They've been raised by their parents to belong, not to stand out, not to stand up. So it's partially about Israel, but it's partially about your attitude toward others and your attitude toward, toward the whole institutional infrastructure of the university life. And, uh, that's one piece of it. The other thing is what I've discovered is tactically, because we're often so reactive, we don't think two steps ahead. So for example, three, four years ago at McGill, um, they had the third or fourth round of the fight over BDS. And I turned to my colleagues and I and a couple of others wrote up a petition denouncing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and BDS in the most neutral but educationally rich terms. And yes, there were many people, because we live in the world of what I call the silence of the tenured lambs, who didn't want to touch it. But I also, I picked a very specific goal. We said, if in the next, if in a week, we can get 10% of the McGill faculty to sign this petition, we'll declare a victory. Now, the McGill faculty is infamously independent. Maybe we all sign our taxes on the same day, and maybe we all sign grades at the same day, more or less, because many of us uh, are slackers. But we were able to, within a week, to get 10% of the faculty, and then we declared victory. And I actually wrote a piece in the Canadian Jewish News, Allah and, um, and said, why not do this in other universities? Why wait for BDS to burst out? And it didn't happen. So I think one of the things, and this is what I was saying at the very beginning, is we, yes, we need to reframe ideologically. We need to be good Zionists, and good Zionists always understood that we don't win by firefighting, but we win by tree planting by really going deep down and, and raising generations of kids who really care. Um, and it comes and it starts again with the parents and with the schools and, and, and with a, a different approach. And, and third, we have to start thinking proactively, creatively, tactically on campus so that we tap in. There are all kinds of Jewish professors who are silent. They don't wanna be involved in yelling and screaming about BDS, but when we turn to them, not to fight a resolution, not to confront their students, God forbid, but to simply sign off on a constructive educational statement, they were with us. And frankly, we, we allied with non-Jews too. One uh, of my colleagues, John Zuki, wrote me an email saying, thank you so much. I was watching this and I didn't know how to respond and you gave me the framework, you gave me the opportunity to respond uh, constructively. So we often have hidden allies who we have, whom we haven't activated because we haven't thought creatively enough. Can I weigh in with a quick comment on that? Would that be okay? Please. Uh, I agree with absolutely everything Professor Troy said, but I want to emphasize what a challenge that project is on the campuses because as uh, um, I've loved your work on the idea of like Zionist Jewish identity. I think that's absolutely right. But the campus now, thanks to intersectionality, has developed this identity politics. The dominant position by far is that essentially Jews are white, 
powerful oppressors. Zionism is like the, the big representative of the Jewish collective white power oppressive mantle. And so for a student to adopt that as an identity is to adopt the identity of you know, an imperialist racist oppressor. Uh, we know that's false, right? That's not what the ultimate, uh, and that's what Rudy's trying to push against as well, right? But in the climate on campus to adopt that identity is to, you know, you might as well put on a, Ma a MAGA hat, right, on campus and say, this is who I am. I'm a white, I'm a white colonialist, imperialist, ethnic cleansing, gen genocidal racist and proud. So the challenge is enormous given the campus context that the other side has constructed against us. So I 100% agree with the necessity of this, but I want to emphasize what a challenge it is in the current uh, campus climate. Absolutely, and we should use another phrase that's been weaponized, not just intersectionality, but white privilege, right? And it's so funny. Back in the days when it was cool to be whites, Jews weren't whites. Now that it's not so cool to be whites, we're suddenly whites. And, um, and, and obviously, we do have to have a conversation about some of the advantages that are built in by passing in a society that still is racist. And I'm talking about Canada, not just the United States. But we also have to acknowledge that this white privilege construct assumes that all Jews are white, not true. All Jews are wealthy, not true. And behind that are some very serious anti-Semitic statements, but also start saying, hey, not all Jews are white, buys into that assumption that I think you attacked earlier, which is that just because people are white, they agree on everything, right? And that's what I was calling earlier, that sort of Hobbesian, Marxian notion that there's one way of thinking. I always say to students, I say, if you listen to me and say, hallelujah, I see the light, I'm in trouble because somebody else is gonna come along, they're gonna be far more intelligent or certainly better looking and funnier and you'll say, hallelujah, I see that light. But if you say, I see the grays, then we have a conversation. And the allergy to complexity and this all or nothingness is, as I said, not just a challenge to us as Jews, as Jewish identity builders and as Zionists, but it's a challenge to the essence of the university. Okay, thank you. I, uh, you know, believe it or not, we're, we're in our home stretch now. I want to uh, move back to Rudy now. You know, um, Professor Troy mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, he, he talked about uh, that in his, in his experience and view, Jewish students ha lack rather the resilience to fight. You know, I always use the analogy that, you know, if you want to build up muscle tone, you go to the gym. I mean, I've been to the gym once, never making that mistake again. But my understanding is if you go to the gym, you, you pick up weights, nobody's laughing. Okay, a couple of people like it. And, you know, that's how you develop. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, that's how you develop muscle mass. So, you know, Rudy, you, you talked about strategy, and I think that you have a, a pretty significant reputation as someone who's willing to, you know, shake the, the sacred cow, so to speak, and, and change how Israel advocacy is done. In your experience, how do you think that we can build, so to speak, muscle mass among the next generation of pros, or we're talking about students, among the next generation of pros or students, right? We talk about strategy. We talk about intersectionality. How do we get these young Jews to say, okay, we know what the, our opponents are doing when it comes to intersectionality and coalition building. How do we do this on a ground level? We have to understand what kind of role we're playing. And that's why I don't call myself an Israel advocate. I'm an Israel activist. I'm not a fan supporting a team. I'm a player on the, on the ground. And I'm also not pro-Israel. I am Israel. I'm a part of Israel. So we have to stop seeing ourselves as fans. You know, I don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm pro Rudy. It is obvious that I'm pro Rudy and I have the best interest for myself, the same way Jews should see themselves not as pro Israel, but as a part of Israel. And we have to stop separating ourselves as we're sort of supporters and we need to make a safe place to make us feel happy of what's going on, but we need to see ourselves as player on the ground. And when I say maybe we need to be strong Judean warriors or, or Jewish fighters, it's not necessarily physical fighters, but ideological fighters, being able to stand up when there's uh, any sort of oppression facing our population or any movement seeking to delegitimize our right to exist and our experiences or, or calling us even white and things that don't actually define which people are and being able to narrate that conversation. Now, the answer is going to come from the top. And a lot of Jews, and this is a mistake we've made through our Jewish history, is we tend to go to those that are in power and try to make deals of our investments in, okay, this king or queen or senator or government is going to protect us. But what happens when that king or queen or senator changes to someone else that's in our whole society is no longer functional for them to be supportive of Israel or the Jewish people, then all of a sudden things change and we've invested all of our uh, chips into the same basket, but that actually doesn't work change the current status quo, it's going to long-term battle. It's going to come from the bottom up. We need to change the pop culture. We need a stronger gem than that will time to, to, to Jewish world's allies. 
gave the example earlier of situations. And when Jews are our situations, we don't respond. So we expect the rest of the world and the campuses and the professors to stand alongside with the Jews can talk about our own rights. A big part of this also is redefining the terms. A lot of people talk about being anti-Zionist, but when you ask them to define Zionism, they define it by terms that have nothing to do with Zionism. So you can actually tell them, well, if that Zionism meant, I'd be against it. However, there's a liberal definition of Zionism, which is the self-determination of the Jewish people on their ancestral homeland. And everyone that defines themselves as a Zionist, whether a secular Zionist, religious Zionist, on the left or on the right, define them in these terms. You use the term anti-Zionism and redefine it to something else to get everyone to the conclusion that they should be against what Zionism really means, which is the self-determination of the Jewish people. And then when it comes to colonialism, we have to also uh, redefine these terms. And the story and narrative being pushed right now is that the Jews are a bunch of fake white people from Europe who came and colonized, uh, you know, the Middle East. And a lot of even Jews make the mistake of saying, well, no, they're half of the Jewish population is Sephardic. Well, no, 100% of the Jewish population is not white. When someone is talking about someone being white, it's not talking only about their skin color. There are many Asians that are lighter skin pigmentation uh, than Europeans, than Caucasians, but they're not white. So being white is about having a status and having or the origins of the Jewish people is not from Europe, not culturally, not genetically, not ethnically. And the status of Jews within white societies has never been one of being white. Even if there were some times that we had some sort of equal rights like there is today, there are constant movements ideologically attacking the Jews and anti-Semitism is rapidly growing within all societies. I mean, on the college campus, the only movement that exists to target the minority group is the movement against, right? And the Jewish people are also the only population that is the enemy population of every single population, right? When it comes to uh, Hispanics and to black people and to LGBTQ, there are people that target those populations and that's horrible, but not every single population. When it comes to the Jews, every single population. So we have to understand that many Jews that aren't dark skin or black or of color, they might not go through racism and we, we may be white passing in certain circumstances, but that doesn't mean we have white privilege because white privilege shouldn't only be understood through the lens of one minority group that suffers at the hands of a white supremacist society or a society that has individuals that are white supremacists. You wouldn't tell someone that is of color or a black person that they have white privilege because they don't deal with anti-Semitism. So we shouldn't tell Jews that we have white privilege because some of us don't deal with racism. Our experience with xenophobia may not be constant because our colors can't be depicted right away if we're not someone of color, but the second they see our Magdalene David, uh, read what name we have on our, on our IDs, or see our clothing, or even find out that we're Jewish, and usually at, at this point in the society where anti-Semitism rises and they find out they are, it's not just some sort of racism and, and you know, a murder once in a while, it's an extermination of, of millions of Jews, which we experience constantly throughout history in white societies. So we need to be able to understand our own identity, our experiences, our own narrative, which most Jews do not understand. So we need to change the narrative also, not only of who we are and how the world can understand what we are, but also of the space that Palestinians should have. Why is it that to be pro-Palestinian automatically means to be anti-Israel? We should be actually creating events, and this is a big part of what we were doing on college campuses, to show that there is no future solution where either population disappears. There's no reality where Palestinians disappear from one or the Jewish people disappear from one. So at some point, we have to move forward and create a solution that is, will be achieved. It's not something that will be, be imposed and definitely not imposed by a foreign government, but it will be achieved by bringing both populations together. So it's time to throw out, to, to throw out anti-normalization and to actually bring both populations together to understand what are your experiences? Uh, what are your sufferings? What is your identity? What is your aspirations? And understand, do these things actually contradict? And my experience, I actually live in Israel now, and I'm part of a movement here called Habayit that brings local activists that are both Palestinian and Israelis together to have those conversations and to move forward. And what we figured out is that the aspirations that Palestinians need and the aspirations that the Jewish people need and that Israel needs actually doesn't contradict. And the injustice happening to both populations also doesn't have to contradict. So the, the last thing I, I want to finish off of before I, I just on another thing before is when we understand how Jews react to the situation, I think we need to understand uh, a similar situation to when women are in a, an oppressive and abusive relationship with, with a man. There are three ways in which a woman can react to that sort of relationship. She can fight back and leave, which is, you know, kind of what a lot of us Zionist Jews are doing when we're faced with oppression and, 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 and abuse. We fight back, we stand up, or we leave uh, Germany, we leave America, we go to Israel, whatever it may be. We, we, we try to change that situation. We just don't stand up for it. 
The second thing that a woman can do, which is what most Jews do, is make excuses for it. Pretend it's not that bad. It's okay. You know, maybe the husband was just drunk one time. Uh, he just got mad. Uh, you know, it's not that bad for the Jewish people. It's not. It's just going to get worse if you make something about it. But the third and worst thing that a lot of Jews do, and a lot of Zionists, uh, unfortunately, call these Jews uh, self-hating Jews, is they actually side with their oppressors, where women actually sometimes, unfortunately, blame themselves for the abuse that they receive. Oh, no, I shouldn't respond uh, this way, I shouldn't have answered back, I shouldn't have done this, I should have cleaned the house. And these are very unfortunate situations where there's so much trauma built up that their conclusion is to put their heads down and side with their oppressor. And that's something that also a lot of Jews are doing, mixed also with a lot of misinformation that they uh, are taught and don't actually understand what is happening there. But a lot of Jews actually put their heads down and side with their oppressors. So uh, what we need to understand as Jews in the inner circle is that these aren't self-hating Jews. The self, same way you wouldn't see a woman that is blaming herself for the abuse she receives, you wouldn't call her a self-hating woman. You would understand that her conclusions are, are from a place of, of fear and of trauma, and you would want to help that woman. So we need to help our Jews. Jewish brothers and sisters that have been traumatized by anti-Semitism that has existed and been passed down from generations and that also exists today. In terms of university, actually when I arrived to Columbia, it was actually absolutely not a Zionist space. The only group that claimed to be Zionist on college campus pushed the two-state solution. It was on their slogan, I'm sure it probably still is today. They refused to do any events in public. Uh, their, their methods where we are only for Jews, we can't even allow space for non-Jews to be a part of our group. We'll only do events within our Hillel. We'll only talk about the great things that Israel does. We'll do an Israel Technology 101 day. Are already amongst the Israel Jews that feel better. And their only thing that stated to me was, we need to make sure that BDS doesn't pass. And like I said, regardless of if it passes or not, they're doing the work. I remember when I fought BDS the first time in 2013 at UCLA when I was attending UCLA and we took it down and I saw tears in the, in, in the eyes of my friends, such a success that we, we had that we actually shut it down. And that's when I realized, no, we actually lost. The, 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 the moment that they won was the moment that they actually were able to talk about this on campus. And this is why they bring it every year, not to actually pass the resolution, to bring up the conversation and to convince the future leaders of the society of the country that Israel is the worst thing in the world, which is exactly exactly what anti-Semitism is. Find the Jewish people and connect them to the worst thing that they experience in every single society. So I don't think a campus should be judged by how uh, uh, strong the anti israel movement is, but by how weak the pro israel movement is. That is where the key is. We need to train a next generation. And like I said, uh, you know, we say never again, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen again. It means we took a generational commitment to make sure it doesn't happen again. And if we have logic to the Holocaust, and for it never to happen again, if it does happen again, it means we failed. Meaning we have a responsibility in our generation to make sure that we actually make sure that this doesn't happen and that we train a, a stronger generation. And if we fail to do that, then it's on us. So we need to take more responsibility and understand that the society, the world, the, the king, the queen, the government, the senators aren't going to change things for us. It's our responsibility to build those coalitions, to change the conversation and to narrate our story. Uh, wonderful. Well, listen, this has been an incredible, uh, incredible hour with some some pretty uh, distinguished speakers. So I want to thank uh, Professor Gil Troy, Professor Andrew Pesson, uh, Rudy Rockman, just to give them uh, plugs. So of course, I want to, uh, you know, acknowledge, thank you everyone for joining Honest Reporting Canada in conjunction with Husborough Fellowships Canada. Please follow uh, Rudy on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Uh, please uh, uh, read the Algaminer, follow uh, Professor Pesson on, uh, on Facebook. And uh, Professor Troy has a book coming out in the fall called written with um, Natan Sharansky, if I'm not mistaken, the Zionist Ideas Vision for the Jewish Homeland, then, now, and tomorrow. So I'm sure we'll uh, no, hear more about that. Never Alone is the new book. Never oh, I'm alone. sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, and, and, Let me uh, just add, on Facebook, I, I moderate a Facebook group called Anti-Zionism on Campus just as a clearinghouse for information. Being informed is the first step towards being involved. So anyone who's interested, please feel free to reach out to Anti-Zionism on Campus on, if you happen to be on Facebook. Perfect. And to paraphrase uh, G.I. Joe, knowledge is power. So I think that we need to start with, uh, you know, knowing what the facts are for sure. And like I said, please, uh, please stay tuned. We have a very uh, exciting speaker in a month um, with uh, Honest Reporting Canada for another webinar, but uh, you'll have to wait and, uh, and see who that is. But in the meantime, this has been recorded, so you can always watch it uh, at leisure. We hope to get up on YouTube in the coming days. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Have a wonderful Thank day. You.